So good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, October meetup organized by uh, Click AI, the Computational Linguistics in Quebec Consortium. My name is uh, Fabrizio Gatti. I'm a programmer uh, specialized in NLP, currently working at the um, University of Montreal, and I also work for Ivado. I'll be replacing our previous host, uh, Esam Amini, whom we thank very much for uh, all his good work. So uh, today, once again, uh, we have three uh, very interesting talks. Uh, I'll briefly uh, start by introducing them. So first of all, we have uh, Yutao Zhu, a PhD student at the University of Montreal in my lab, um, who's going to present uh, a talk about open domain knowledge grounded human machine conversation. Then uh, we have the pleasure of um, having a presentation by uh, Guillaume Lebert, PhD student at the Université de Lorraine and Université de Montréal, who's going to uh, present um, a talk about unsupervised multiple choice question generation for out of domain QA fine tuning. And then we're going to have a talk by Florian Carichon, a PhD student at HEC Montréal on abstractive unsupervised summarization of temporal events. So before we start, I'm going to ask everyone to kindly turn off uh, their cameras and mute themselves so that uh, we can enjoy the presentations um, without any distraction. Every talk is going to be followed as usual by a five to 10 minute question answering session. So if you have any question during the presentation, you can write them down and then ask them at the end of each talk. We're going to move on now to the first presentation by uh, Yutao Chu, a PhD student at the Université uh, de Montréal. Yutao, uh, if you want to share your screen, the floor is yours. You can start whenever you're ready. OK, thank you, Fabrizio. You're welcome. OK, you can. Can you see the screen? It's perfect. OK. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining my talk. I'm Yutao from University of Montreal. Uh, my talk is about knowledge-grounded human machine conversation. In this talk, I will first introduce some background knowledge about conversation system and knowledge grounded conversation. Then I will talk about two works that I have done in my research. Finally, I will make a brief conclusion and introduce some potential future work. Uh, at first, what is a human machine conversation? Human machine conversation aims at designing a conversation system that can communicate with human beings. It is a very important problem of AI and NLP research. Conversation systems have been widely applied in our daily life, especially in some intelligent assistants like Apple Siri. They can help us deal with daily affairs. So we can see building a conversation system is popular and important for both academic and industry. In research community, dialogue systems can be divided into two groups. The first one is domain specific system which is also known as task-oriented system. They are designed for specific tasks, such as booking tickets. Another group is open domain system, which is also called chatbots. They are used to chit chat with us on daily topic. This is also the focus in my study. The first open domain dialogue system is ELIZA, born in 1966. It is built on a large number of handcrafted scripts and some domain knowledge. Nowadays, with large-scale conversational data on the internet, the data-driven approach becomes the mainstream. These approaches can be categorized as generation-based methods and retrieval-based methods according to their different implementations. The generation-based methods then a model to generate a response from scratch. The most famous structure is sequence-to-sequence -sequence model. As shown here, there is an encoder to represent the user input as a vector and the decoder is used to generate a response based on the vector. With such a model, generation-based methods can make a response for any user input. However, as all responses are generated by the model, they may contain grammar faults and repeated words. Another famous problem is the evaluation. 
because the generated response may be different from the golden one, but it can still be a possible response. On the contrary, retrieval-based methods do not generate a response, but select a response from a large repository, as shown here. An index-based system first uses the user input as query to get some response candidates, and then the retrieval-based system will rank these candidates and select the most suitable response as the reply. So we can see during this process, the written response is always fluent and grammatical correct because it is written by human. However, if the repository is not large enough, the system may not provide a suitable response. So in my study, we mainly focus on retrieval-based methods because we can get a high quality response with a large repository. And this method is easy to evaluate as a ranking problem. Here is a very classic framework for retrieval-based chatbots. This is also a basic structure in my work. So I introduce it here. We can see the whole framework has three stages, including representation, matching, and aggregation. In the representation stage, the dialogue context and the response candidate are represented by a pre-trained embedding table and a recurrent neural network. Then in the matching stage, a matching map between each utterance and the response is computed. Convolutional neural network and max pooling operations are applied here to extract matching features. Finally, in the aggregation stage, these matching features are, are aggregated by another recurrent neural network and compute the final score. With the methods mentioned above, the system can return a fluent response for the user input, as shown in the left side. However, we can see it is still difficult for the chatbot to dive into a specific topic so there is a still a big gap between human conversation and human machine conversation. One of the primary reasons is the lack of knowledge. As shown in the right side, when we provide some knowledge about table tennis to the chatbots, it is promising to improve the conversation quality. Inspired by this, researchers proposed the knowledge-grounded conversation. In this task, the extra knowledge is also provided to the chatbot so that it can use the knowledge to make a better response. Here, I briefly introduce three knowledge-grounded conversation tasks. In this task, the knowledge is represented in different forms. The first one is personalized conversation. In this task, the user profile is used as external knowledge, so the chatbot can use this profile to make a personalized response. The second one is document-grounded conversation. This scenario is usually appeared on some online forums. For example, on Reddit, people can talk about a new, a new stock document in the thread. So the knowledge here is re represented by a document. The third one is knowledge graph-based conversation. As shown in the figure, the knowledge is represented by a graph. So here, I want to summarize some important problems in the knowledge-grounded conversation. Some of them have been tackled by existing studies. The first one is how to collect the data. There, are, there have been many studies on this problem. Now, we have many conversational datasets with knowledge in different forms, like the document and the knowledge graph I have shown. The second problem is how to select the knowledge. The knowledge usually contains a lot of information, but only a part of it can be used in the conversation. As, as the example shown in the left side, we color the content in the document that is used in the conversation. So we can see not all contents are useful. To select the knowledge, existing studies propose some methods based on attention mechanism. However, we find that some irrelevant part of knowledge is a noise, so a hard selection is more helpful. This is one work in our study. The third problem is knowledge integration. In the existing studies, the knowledge is often used to improve the quality of the response, but this system can only work passively. We think that with the knowledge, the system can perform more proactively. For example, here, when we have the knowledge about the movie Inception, then the system can proactively talk about the director and the introduction of the movie. We will introduce this kind of proactive conversation later. Finally, Evaluation metric is, is also an important problem. 
There are some methods proposed for general conversation, but none of them is designed for uh, knowledge grounded conversation. This is an important future work of our study. Now I will introduce the work that I studied. Before that, I want to give a definition of our task. In my study, I focus on retrieval based methods. The input of the task includes a dialogue context containing several utterances, a knowledge pool, and a response candidate. Our target is to learn a matching model to predict the score for the response candidate. Our first work is context aware knowledge selection. This work has have been presented at ECIR conference. Let's use the example to show the problem. This is a conversation between two people. They are talking about the movie Inception. The knowledge about this movie is provided by a document here, which is a kind of extra knowledge. The colored part is used in the conversation. I choose three response candidates here. The last one is a golden response, which should be selected by the model. R1 and R2 are two negative responses. Existing methods will predict a high score for R1 because it contains many contents from the document, but it is not a suitable response. We can see the last utterance U6 ask a question, is it a long movie? This question is not answered by R1. So this example tells us merely select the response containing document content is not enough. The response should be consistent with the dialogue context. That is to say, when we select the knowledge, we should consider the dialogue context. R2 can answer the question in U6, and it also uses the knowledge provided in the document. However, it is still not good because it is redundant with the third utterance, making the conversation very boring. So this example tells us, when selecting knowledge, we should focus on the recent dialogue topic rather than the whole dialogue context. For the first problem, Existing studies propose several soft selection mechanisms based on attention, but we think it is not enough. The irrelevant content in the document can still influence the model. We propose a hard selection mechanism in which the irrelevant part will be directly filtered out. For the second problem, in existing studies, all dialogue contexts are used for knowledge selection. The above example indicates we should focus more on recent topics. Our method is called Content Selection Network. As can be seen, we design a selection mechanism here. This is our main contribution. The document is selected based on the context. Our selection mechanisms are in two levels, namely the sentence level and word level. After the selection, the context knowledge and the response candidate will pass the matching aggregation framework, which is the same as I introduced in background knowledge. So the details will be omitted here. So at first, the context, knowledge, and response candidate are represented as vectors by a pre-training embedding table and a bidirectional LSTM network. The principle of selection mechanism is using the weight to update the representation of the word or the sentence. So we design the selection in two levels. For sentence level selection, the whole sentence will be set as the same weight. For the example here, the weight of the sentence is 0 0.8. As for word level selection, each word in the sentence will be assigned to different ways like this. Here, I use an example to explain the sentence level selection. The left side is, as, is three utterances in the context. The bottom is the sentence in the document containing the movie name inception. Here, our selection is to, de to decide whether this knowledge sentence is useful. To achieve this, we compute the cosine similarity between each utterance and the knowledge sentence. We can see the first utterance have a high similarity. After getting three scores, we fuse them as a final score. This final score reflects the relevance between the knowledge sentence and the whole dialogue context. As we introduced earlier, the irrelevant part of knowledge can be a kind of noise, so we filter it out. This is achieved by adding a gate here. If the matching score is less than the gamma, we will set it as zero, so the corresponding sentence is filtered out. The gamma is a threshold hyperparameter, which will be tuned in our experiments. After the gate, 
the weight will multiply with the original sentence representation. So the representation is updated. Imagine that if the score is zero here, the representation will be masked. So our filtering is achieved. This is the sentence level selection. As for word level selection, things are similar, but we compute a weight for each word. The, ir the irrelevant words will be masked. The second problem we should solve is that the recent topic in the context is more important for knowledge selection. So we design a decay mechanism. Following the previous example, we multiply the similarity score by a hyperparameter eta. The eta is set less than one, so the former utterance will have less weight. In this example, we set eta as 0 0.9. We can see the first score will be decayed most. In this way, the model is forced to concentrate on the current utterances when selecting knowledge. After knowledge selection, the remaining part is a standard matching aggregation framework, so I skip the details here. The whole model is optimized by a cross entropy loss with the label. We conduct experiments on two document grounded conversation datasets. The evaluation metric is required k, which is commonly used in ranking problem. Here are results. We, we can see our proposed method can achieve better performance than the baseline on all datasets. This demonstrates the effectiveness of our proposed hard selection mechanism. Besides, we find word level selection performs slightly better than sentence level selection. I think this is because the word level selection can capture more fine grained information. So in this work, we propose the context of where not selection model. We show that our hard selection is a very effective in knowledge grounded conversation, and the recent dialogue topic is much more important in knowledge selection. The second work is about proactive dialogue with knowledge in the graph. This work is presented in CIGAR conference. In the previous works and existing studies, the knowledge is used to enhance the quality of the response, but the system can only work passively. They are unable to initiate the conversation, ask a question, or start a new topic, so the conversation may be boring quickly. Actually, we find that using knowledge can help the dialogue system become more proactive. Here is an example to explain what is a proactive conversation system. In the left side, the dialogue, uh, the traditional dialogue system can only reply to the user passively. While in the right side, with some knowledge, the chatbot can propose some new topics. Here, the chatbot can recommend the movie MacDow to the user. Proactive conversation system is newly proposed in recent years. There are only a few studies on this, so the definition of the task is still under explored. Here, we use the dataset created by a re recent work for proactive dialogue. We can see in addition to the knowledge and conversation, there is a Google here. The Google contains several entities. Before a dialogue, these entities and related knowledge are provided to the chatbot. So the chatbot is asked, asked to mention these entities in the dialogue. In this way, the chatbot can perform more proactively. In this example, the entities include the movie MacDow and the movie star Peng Bo. We can see in the dialogue, the chatbot can use the knowledge to lead the dialogue proactively. The entities are mentioned in the third and seventh utterance. In research, some other definitions of the goal are, are also investigated. Here is just a simple scenario. Note that the knowledge in the dataset is represented by as a graph. Each piece of knowledge is, re is represented by a triplet containing two entities and their relation. In our work, we do not consider the graph structure, but use these triplets as text. We propose a KPN model for proactive dialogue. The process can be divided into three steps. The first step is goal tracking. The model needed to check which entities have been mentioned in the dialogue history and which one is the current focus. The next step is knowledge prediction. The model needs to predict the knowledge related to the focus entity. Finally, the, select, the selected knowledge and dialogue context are matched with the response candidate and computer score. 
This part is also a standard representation matching aggregation framework. I will introduce the first two steps in detail. The first one is goal tracking. I want to use an example to illustrate it. Assume there are two entities in the goal. The first one is Peng Bo, which is a movie star. The second one is MacDao, which is a movie name. The dialog context is concatenated as a long sequence. Here, I only show a part of the sequence. We compute a matching map between each word in the entity and each word in the dialog context. As can be seen, the entity Peng Bo is mentioned by the dialog, so their scores are very high. Then we conduct a row-wise max pooling operation to get the maximum matching signal. Here, the three scores are 0 0.1, 1.0, and 1.0. Next, we use one minus these scores, and the result can reflect which entity is not mentioned. Here, the second entity, MacDow, will have a high score, indicating it should be mentioned in the following conversation. Finally, we multiply the score to the entity representation. By this operation, the mentioned entity will be masked, and the representation of the goal is updated. After getting the focused entity, the next question is how to predict its relevant knowledge. I, use, I also use an example to describe the process. While predicting the knowledge, we should consider both the dialogue context and the goal. As analyzed in previous work, we, we know the recent dialogue is more important. So here, we, we simply use the last M utterances, and M is a hyperparameter. We first compute a relevant score between the goal and the knowledge triplet. This score reflects if the knowledge is about the focused entity. Similarly, we can also compute a score between each utterance and the knowledge triplet. So we get M plus one scores here. Then we fuse these scores by a multi-layer perceptron and output a final score. This final score is the weight of the knowledge triplet. So we multiply it with the triplet representation. In our experiments, we find the knowledge prediction is very difficult to learn. A potential reason is the whole model is trained by the final response selection laws. So it is difficult to tell whether a mistake stems from the misuse of knowledge or other problems in the structure. So to tackle this problem, we propose a heuristic method to label the knowledge triplets. These weak lab labels can directly optimize the knowledge prediction process. So here is an example for how to get the weak labels. Consider the dialogue context. Of course, could you recommend a movie for me? I can watch it in the weekend. The golden response is, you can watch MacDow, which is rated 6.9. It is obvious the first piece of knowledge is used in the response. So we want our model to predict the first piece of knowledge before selecting the response. To get the label, we match the golden response with the with each knowledge triplet. Here, the first one is matched, so its label is one. The other two knowledge triplets are not matched, so their labels are zero. We compute a knowledge prediction loss based on the label by cross entropy. The loss can supervise the knowledge prediction process directly, and the final performance can be improved. The remaining part is the standard representation matching aggregation framework. I skipped the details. The whole model is trained by a combined loss with the weight lambda. We conduct experiments on two datasets. They contain a goal, a knowledge graph, and corresponding dialogue. We test all models in two scenarios and evaluate them by several metrics. Here are the results. We can see our method can outperform existing work significantly. The first group of metrics evaluated the performance of response selection. We can see our model has better performance. The second group of metrics evaluated the performance of knowledge prediction. This demonstrates our proposed weak labels can help the knowledge prediction process. The last metric measures the performance of goal tracking. It is clear to see that our tracking method is very useful. We also conduct an ablation study, and we can see both knowledge and the goal are very important in this task. So in this work, we propose a multi-task framework for proactive conversation system. 
We use weak labels and design a goal tracking mechanism. This kind of system can make the conversation more interesting and more informative. In the future, we'd like to explore more complex goal in the task. During the study, we also find some challenges, but uh, that should be tackled in the future, including the integration of various knowledge and evaluation method. We find that in the conversation, we human can use knowledge from different sources and knowledge in different forms. For example, we know ants are smaller than elephants. This knowledge may be constructed after we see the two animals. So the visual Modality help us on building such knowledge, but in knowledge grounded conversation, this kind of data are difficult to collect. Even we can collect some knowledge in different forms, it is still hard to reconcile them. This is a very difficult problem. Recent years, some researchers proposed many multimodal datasets. We think it may be a potential solution. Finally, the evaluation method for conversation is a well known problem because there are more than one good response in the world. We can see different sentences. We can use different sentences to reply to others, but we can only collect some of them in the datasets. So sometimes the response different from the golden one may, may also be a possible response. Traditional reference-based metrics like blue and Roj cannot tackle this problem. So researchers propose several non-reference-based metrics like bird score to compute the similarity between the generated response and the golden one in vector space. However, there are no specific metrics for knowledge-grounded conversation. This is more challenging because the knowledge is involved. The context consistency and the knowledge consi consistency should be balanced. We believe it is a very important problem in the future. That's all for today's talk. Thank you. If you have any question, you can ask me. Thank you so much, uh, Yitao Zhu, for your uh, excellent presentation. So um, we have about uh, a few minutes uh, for questions. Um, if you have any question, you can use uh, the button in the upper right corner of uh, Teams to uh, raise your hand, and then uh, we can you can ask your question. So, so, uh, as there are no questions right now, uh, Yutao, I have a few questions for you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'll start with, uh, on slide uh, 32, um, you show the uh, importance of uh, the hyperparameter um, eta uh, mm -hmm. to uh, select uh, the, the topic uh, that is uh, important uh, to, to model uh, that element of the dialogue. Yeah. But my question is, um, would it not be very important to take into account the very first sentence, the very first utterance in such a dialogue? Because in the first one is very special. It, it sets the, the topic for the rest of the dialogue. So. Does it not uh, warrant a special treatment, that very first utterance? Uh, uh, I think uh, it depends on which kind of conversation we have. Uh, for example, in our daily life, our uh, first uh, uh, our first sentence in the dialogue may be some greetings, like hello, hi, like, like this. So, so, so this, um, this is not important for the dialogue. Uh, but but if we are talking about some specific topic, uh, that 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 may be more important. Uh, so here I, I I just want to say, uh, if if the dialogue is is very long, uh, so so more more recent uh, sentences in the dialogue uh, are more are more important. I see, but uh, I think it, it may be interesting to to find the maybe the very first important topic that is uh, broached uh, within the dialogue so that you can maybe focus on that. Because usually a dialogue as an important, a central topic that could be identified and that could be weighed uh, a little more heavily uh, than uh, topics, satellite topics, if you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so I think uh, we, we, we may be 
uh, need a mechanism to find which uh, utterance in the dialogue is, is more important currently. Uh, it, it, it may be better for the model, I think. Right. I have another question, if you don't mind. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, eta here is a hyperparameter, and yeah. uh, have you uh, looked into uh, its uh, uh, impact on the results? I think on the next slide you show uh, the results for uh, that system, or yeah. Uh, do you have an idea? Uh, do you, have you worked on uh, ablation studies uh, that would be yeah, focusing yeah, yeah. on ETA? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We we, we oh. conduct experiments to explore the influence of the hyperparameter in my model. So so the the right side is the influence of the decay factor, uh, namely ETA. Oh, so when ETA is one there is no decay effect. All dialogue contexts will be used equally to select the knowledge. We can see the performance is not very good. When eta is zero, only the last utterance is used for knowledge selection. We can see the performance also dropped. So this experiment tells us the last utterance uh, is, 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 very, is very useful. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Although the uh, after uh, below, uh, no, for one, the, the performance is lower, but after that, uh, the performance at 0 0.9, 0 0.5, 0 0.1 are k kind of similar, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. For your last, uh, so your second, uh, the second part of your presentation, you tell, mm -hmm. um, you propose a, a knowledge graph uh, to make the dialogue more proactive. But I yeah. see that uh, on the slide that you're showing right now, thank you, uh, you, sh you show single hop between McDowell and Opong. I'm sorry, the pronunciation is difficult. Okay, okay. okay. No problem. <laughs> uh, between, between McDowell and Bo Pong. So, uh, would it be possible to have multi hops so that you can go from McDowell to Canada, for instance, uh, by by jumping yeah, yeah, yeah. over one uh, node? Yeah, yeah, it, it's a very good question. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, related to the construction of the data set. So in in this data set, uh, there is uh, we only uh, we only have a one hop or two hops uh, relation. Uh, this is determined by uh, by the original author of the data set. Uh, I think uh, if there are more uh, hops, the, the task will be more difficult. So, so this is only a, a study in early stage. I see. Yes, because uh, you said that you're still uh, in the, the definition part of the task because it is so new. Yeah, yeah, it is. This is a very simple scenario. I see. And uh, you showed the evaluation metric for that part, but evaluation is so hard for for that task. Um, I was wondering, would it? Do you have an idea of the performance if you select a random entity uh, in the neighborhood of the main entity and propose it to the reader? It, maybe. Randomness uh, offers interesting performance. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe you can select, uh, uh, but uh, some entities are not important than others. Uh, for example, when, when we talk about the movie star, we may uh, the, the 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 comment may be more important, but but his blood type is is not, is not so important. So we need to decide which which entities around the uh, around uh, are more important yeah you're right of course and yeah. the blood type may be may be interesting for a doctor for instance <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> thank you so much okay, thank so you so are there any other question If not, then we're going to thank our presenter, Yutao. Your presentation was uh, very, very interesting, Yutao. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. And uh, 
we will now uh, move on to the second presentation by uh, another student at my lab and Guillaume Lebert, who is a PhD candidate at the uh, Université de Lorraine and also at the Université de Montréal, who's going to present a very interesting talk for those of you who are uh, stuck with the too little data in the question answering field. And his talk is going to be uh, unsupervised multiple choice question generation for out of domain QA fine tuning. So uh, Guillaume, uh, welcome. Would you like to share your screen, please? Yep. Do, do, you, do you see my screen? It's absolutely perfect. Thank you so okay. much. So now, uh, Guillaume, the floor is yours. Okay. So hello, everyone. Um, so as explained by Fabrizio, I will present um, a new method that is uh, a new question generation um, method or new yeah new question generation method that can be used to fine tune uh, existing question answering models on new data sets or new domains. So first, let's start with a bit of introduction. So why do we care about uh, question answering? So one first answer is that it's uh, one of the main tasks in uh, natural language processing, along with other things like summarization or translation. And it's a particularly difficult task because it requires to really deeply understand the semantic of the questions. And it also sometimes requires uh, to have uh, really important uh, world knowledge in order to be, uh, to be able to answer uh, some questions. And finally, it allows uh, interaction with human users. So it, it's one of the tasks that will uh, eventually allow uh, users to interact with uh, AI systems. Uh, when we talk about question answering, it's not only one task, it's actually a set of tasks. There is a lot of different uh, question answering data sets. Uh, for example, we can talk about extractive question answering with the example of Squad. Uh, Squad is a data set, a question answering data set where uh, models have access to a reference text and they have to select a span of text in the reference that answer uh, the question. And usually in extractive question answering, state of the art models are often equal human performances. So we can see uh, here at the bottom the current state of the art on squad and uh, an example of question. So we can also talk about multiple choice question answering like open book QA. Uh, open book QA is uh, composed of questions with each time four possible uh, answer choices. And this time you don't have access to reference text. So you need to have some kind of world knowledge in order to be able to answer each questions. And this world knowledge can be, uh, can be from previous training or from uh, an external database, for example. And usually on this kind of more complicated question answering data sets, uh, human performances are not yet equaled by deep learning models. And of course, there is a lot of other examples of uh, question answering data sets. We can talk about, for example, uh, BullQ, that is um, a yes or no type uh, question answering data set. Or as a result, so narrative QA, natural questions for abstractive tech, uh, question answering. And of course, all the multiple choice question answering data set like common sense QA, ARC, MC test. And traditionally, this task of question answering was uh, quite difficult for deep learning models because first, the databases that are, are often small, the, the data sets that we use need to be constructed by uh, uh, human annotation. And it's, uh, it's, it's quite difficult to, to, to build them. You, you need a lot of time to, to annotate the, the data. And so this 
small size of the data sets is really problematic because usually deep learning models need a lot of uh, data. And furthermore, some questions require, uh, as I said, a good word knowledge. And so it, it's a bit related to the first point. If you don't have uh, that many uh, training examples, you won't have uh, word knowledge uh, broad enough to be able to answer uh, new questions on different domains. And uh, in addition, it is you in order to answer a question, you usually have to understand the meaning of the question, the semantic of the question. And this can be uh, problematic for uh, deep learning models. And so recently, or more, not so recently now, but uh, pre-trained models have been uh, introduced. Uh, these pre-trained models such as BERT, uh, Roberta, or T5 are trained, are previously trained on a large uh, data sets of an annotated data. Um, they are trained with some form of uh, word demasking task. And uh, they quickly became like an, ess an essential in uh, question answering, since uh, nowadays most uh, state-of-the-art models in question answering are uh, pre-trained models. And so, one such data set that we can uh, that we studied is Unified QA. So, Unified QA is based on a T5 model, and as such, is uh, is composed of two transformer. Uh, one encoder and one decoder, and is actually a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model. So you input a sequence uh, of word to the model, and it will output a sequence of word. Uh, one particularity of unified QA is that unlike previous models that, have, that are trained with one particular type of question answering in mind, such as uh, extractive question answering, for example, some previous model would, would uh, be trained only for extractive uh, question answering. Unified QA is trained on all the different types of question answering all at once. And this is allowed by the fact that it is a sequence to sequence model. So every type of question answering is transformed into a sequence. For example, in for abstractive question answering, you would you'd have the reference text, then the question, and the model would have to write down the span of text that uh, that is the answer, uh, things like this. So, and for multiple choice, you would input the question plus uh, all the different answer choices. And again, you would ask the model to uh, write the answer. And Unified QA is a really successful model, and it, it is actually a state of the art on a large number of question answering data sets. So what's the problem with that? The problem is that even if I, I even models like Unified QA that are really, really good uh, general purpose question answering models might struggle to generalize to new data sets, especially if these new data sets are about uh, unseen domains, like things that it hasn't seen before. And so rather than using annotated data to uh, to, uh, to to retrain or to uh, fine-tune the unified QA to these new data sets, we would like to be able to automatically and uh, in an unsupervised manner generate question for that data set and fine-tune unified, unified QA using these questions and then see if we can obtain uh, better results. So in the following, we will explore the this idea of generating, generating questions in order to fine tune a unified QA on new data sets. Um, in order to test our question generation process, we needed some data sets that are uh, complex enough, that have uh, like a complex enough uh, domains, and that have not been used when training unified QA. Because as, as I said, unified QA have been trained on a lot of question answering data sets, so we needed some data set that has not been used in the original training. And we choose uh, PsyQ. PsyQ is a multiple choice question answering data set that dealt with, deals with um, physics, biology, and chemistry. And the questions in PsyQ are quite high level compared to what Unified QA have 
uh, as seen before. And uh, they are about really specific uh, things in uh, physics or biology. So here uh, at the bottom of the frame, you can see an example of question in uh, PsyQ. So as you can see, it's pretty high domain compared to the high school uh, level questions used originally uh, to train unified QA. And one thing that would be important for uh, the following is that uh, even though you're not supposed to use this support text for uh, to answer the question, each question in uh, PsyQ is adjoined with a support text that gives the required information in order to answer the question. We also tested our method on two other datasets that are QASK and Common Sense QA. And these two have a similar form to PsyQ, meaning that they are, they are both multiple choice question answerings with uh, different uh, multiple uh, uh, choices for answers. However, the theme that are represented in the questions are quite simpler. And uh, most of the time, the distractors are easier than PsyQ, meaning that uh, most of the time a human uh, user will be able to eliminate uh, one or two uh, distractors just because they, they do not have the required lexical field or they, are, they do not respect the grammar or things like this. So next uh, we'll present the method that we use to generate uh, the questions. So first thing, uh, we needed to have some data, some uh, world uh, information in order to, to start the, the generation. And so we extracted pages from Wikipedia. We actually started from the three main themes of PsyQ that are physics, biology, and chemistry. And we extracted every page that, uh, that is labeled by one of these themes or any sub-themes recursively. And we kept only the first paragraph, paragraphs, so the summary paragraphs of each page. And these paragraphs are split into sentences, and each sentence is uh, filtered. Uh, we remove, for example, sentences with uh, special uh, characters or sentences that are not well formed. So they, if they don't start with a capital S letter, for example, we remove that sentence. And we also remove the content of parentheses. So here you can see different examples of sentence, uh, sentences that we that we obtain by this process. And as you can see, we obtain like quite uh, simple sentences that, uh, that are really useful when generating questions. Um, and so next, uh, our question generation uh, method is based on stanza and GS real B. And each sentence, will be transformed into one or more questions. Uh, the average is one or 1.4 questions per sentence. And this method will uh, start by generating the dependence, dependency tree of a sentence. And then we can generate questions from of different types. And depending on the type of question we want to generate, we will search for particular a particular structure in the dependency tree. For example, if we want to generate a what type of question, we will search for a noun phrase in the dependency tree. And we will replace that noun phrase by the uh, interrogative word, in our case, what. And then rearrange the other words, actually the other uh, phrases in our sentence to get a question out of it. And again, here are examples of questions that we obtain with this process. So uh, yeah, as you can see, the, the questions are, of, uh, are quite good in general. They are off, sometimes they can be of a bit weird, like in the case of that first question, which is a bit long and a bit weird, but uh, overall they are quite of, uh, of a good quality. Now, since we are dealing with uh, multiple choice question answering, we need to select a set of distractors, so a set of wrong answers to adjoin with each question. Uh, a simple approach to do this is to select random distractors. And in order to do this, we select 
we actually select three random distractors among the right answers to similar questions. So similar questions mean uh, if it's a what type of question, we will search for uh, similar uh, questions or other what type uh, of question and we'll select um, three distractors among the answers to these. So one problem with uh, such, a, such an approach is that the distractors that are selected are not that good in the sense that uh, even for even if I don't know anything about biology, I will be able to eliminate most of the distractors in that question just because they don't deal with the right uh, domain. Like uh, climate, for example, has nothing to do with the question. So we needed to find a way to refine these distractors and to find harder distractors. And to do this, we used uh, another pre-trained model, Roberta. And what we did is that we took our questions that are generate, generated with random distractors and we trained Roberta to uh, solve the question answering task. Basically, we trained Roberta to select uh, the right answer in a set of uh, randomly generated distractors. And what we obtain at the end is a model that will, actually, will give a score to a candidate uh, question to a candidate uh, answer given a question. And since Roberta has less capacity than, for example, Unified QA, we know that it will mostly learn uh, biases, things like uh, is the answer plural or singular? Uh, is the answer uh, in the right domain? For example, this will be the kind of things that Roberta will learn during that train. And so in order to select new distractors, we will Again, select at random a set of uh, candidate distractors among, uh, in our data sets. In our case, we take uh, 64 uh, candidates. And we will score using Roberta each of these candidates uh, with regard to the question. And then we will select the three candidates that uh, output the best score. So here are uh, the new distractors that are obtained. So the, the previous question with random distractors and the new refined distractors. And uh, as you can see, these new defi refined distractors are much closer to what, uh, what we should have as uh, wrong answers. And it becomes really harder for someone that don't know anything about uh, biology to answer that question. I think especially they are all, uh, they at, at least respect the lexical field that is required uh, for, the, for the question. So what, uh, will it, what will be the results of this on our data sets? So what we did is that we took Unified QA and we fine-tuned it with uh, different uh, generated data sets in order to see which one would get uh, the higher score. Uh, the first line here corresponds to a unified QA uh, with no fine tune, meaning we don't retrain unified QA, we just apply it to our data sets and we obtain something like 65% uh, accuracy, so 65% uh, right answer. We also fine tuned unified QA with the annotated data, so as the annotated training set of SciQ, and we obtain something closer to 79% uh, accuracy. And this gives us the objective that we want to reach with our uh, unsupervised generation, generation process. We, we would like to be as close as possible to uh, the scores obtained with annotated data without uni using annotated data. The three next lines here uh, are the results obtained with random distractors. As you can see, we, we have our Wikipedia data, but we also train, uh, tested two other settings. And these settings are, uh, as I said at the uh, when presenting SciQ, SciQ is adjoined, uh, adjoined with each question with uh, support text. And what we did is we took all these support text, we merged them together in a large pool of sentences, and um, we used our question generation process on these. Uh, and this basically, even if it's not entirely uh, unsupervised, simulates a situation where we have um, 
a selection of sentences that are much closer to the subject. For example, let's, uh, if we have a, an instruction manual for some kind of machine, or if we have a school book uh, for a particular domain, we will have a much tighter selection of sentences, and this setting simulates that. And we compare two different uh, settings for this data set, one where we use both train and test set support text, meaning that we are sure 100% that the information required to answer the questions are present somewhere in our sentences. And we also compared it to um, a setting where we, we use only the support text from the train set. So it's a bit more realistic uh, setting where we have uh, related sentences, but not entirely uh, on, on subject. And so as we can see, even with random distractors, we can obtain a significant boost in performances compared to unified QA without fine tuning when using our generating questions. Furthermore, if we refine our distractors, if we use better distractors, harder distractors, we can see uh, an additional performance boost. So we can really greatly improve the performances of unified QA uh, by this question generation process that is unsupervised. We also tested our method on QASK and Common Sense QA. So, uh, and this time again, we have similar results, meaning that compared to Unified QA uh, without any uh, modification, we obtain a significant uh, performance boost. Performance boost, uh, and again with that, with uh, refined distractors. However, we can see that the gain uh, from uh, adding refined distractors is uh, much milder. Meaning, uh, and this can be explained by the fact that in QASK and Common Sense QA, as I said before, the distractors that are in the test set are not that hard, and so the, there is less advantage to uh, make the training sets, uh, like our generating data, harder if in the test set they are easy. Uh, so, in conclusion, uh, the presented method is an efficient way to improve the results of uh, existing general purpose pre trained models on out of domain data sets. Uh, the refining method for distractors also improved uh, the results, even uh, if it depends on the data set. So, if the data set that we want to test uh, that method on is already easier, it, it has less impact to refine uh, the distractors. And uh, as a future work, we want to, com to compare this uh, question generation method with other uh, generation methods, for example, uh, uh, supervised uh, methods, and see how they compare. And um, another idea is to uh, try to vary the difficulty of the distractors uh, depending on the test uh, set that we want to use. So that's it for my presentation. Uh, thank you for, uh, for attending, and uh, if you have questions, uh, please ask. Thank you. Thank you so much, Guillaume. A very interesting uh, presentation and uh, very aligned with the kind of problems that uh, some of our uh, industry partners are having right now, meaning that uh, they don't have enough data to, uh, to fine tune uh, question answering uh, systems. So um, we now have time for a few questions. Um, if uh, you have a question, once again, you can use uh, the raise hand icon in Teams. And then uh, I'll leave the floor to you uh, as soon as I see uh, your raised hand. But uh, I think that uh, I would like uh, to, to ask a, a question to Guillaume. Um, uh, Guillaume, just a question of uh, numbers right now. Uh, could you give us a sense of um, the number of uh, training examples that are already uh, used by Unified QA and uh, the number of uh, synthetic examples that you produced using your method, just to, to get an idea uh, of, uh, of the, the difference between the two data sets? It's hard to say because it uses a lot of data sets, but already used by Unified QA, we can count on maybe uh, hundreds of thousands of examples. Uh, 
that have already been used for pre-training uh, Unified QA before. And the number of generated questions for my data set is around uh, 100,000 questions. Okay. New so, question at the end. So you yeah. match the volume of Unified QA? Uh, no, I wouldn't say so because I think Unified QA is closer to maybe 500,000 or, or more because, uh, for example, they, they use data sets like Squad that are quite big in comparisons along with uh, data sets like OpenBook QA that are really, uh, really small. So uh, again, it's an estimation. I'm not sure about that number. I understand. Um, have you run any experiments where you, uh, you uh, vary the size of uh, the number of examples that you generate to, to get a sense of uh, the impact on performance? Uh, not yet, but that's uh, one of the things yeah, we, we want to do, like uh, test uh, with additional data, maybe scrap Wikipedia with a, with a larger uh, set of Wikipedia, for example. Yeah, of course, because you have, uh, thanks to your method, you have almost an unlimited supply of, uh, of possible questions. Yeah. But they, they have to be on point, so that's why we, right now, I limited myself to uh, to the pages that were uh, dedicated to a really a limited set of themes in order to match the, the themes that, uh, the domains that are used inside you. But yeah, we, we can probably extend that or maybe use, instead of using the first paragraphs of each page, we could also extend to uh, all the paragraphs uh, in a page. Things like this. Yeah, sure, of course. Are there any questions? Don't be shy. Um, on slide uh, 17, um, Guillaume, if you could uh, show yep. it again, please. 17? Yeah. Do you 17. see it? Um, yes. So uh, this is the selection of distractors. Um, I think that the risk with that kind of method is that you can select a distractor that is actually a, a right answer. And on slide 18, you show an example where you have just that, where uh, you propose mesophile, but the refined distractors include carbohydrates and small cell fragments called platelet. And these two answers are correct. Yeah, the living part is quite debatable, but yeah. You're right. Uh, it's found living in or, yeah, you're right, in or on the bodies or other animals. You're right, you're right. Um, it's it's actually one of the, that's why we, we'll, there is two reasons why we limit the set of candidates. Uh, first, because we cannot set a test or generate the score for every candidate in our data set and every equation, it would be too long. But that's also the reasons is that we don't want to generate too much right answers. So by selecting a limited set of candidates, we limit the possible new distractors. And so we limit the probability that Roberta will select uh, right answers. Uh, but anyway, the it's, it's not that much of a problem it's if it doesn't uh, happen too often, actually, since uh, deep learning models are able to, to cope with that, uh, as long as uh, you don't have uh, all right answers among your distractors, it will be okay. Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, maybe uh, another option would be to set some sort of threshold uh, yeah. of similarity and say that uh, you will only accept distractors below a certain similarity threshold. Yeah, uh, that's what uh, one of the the ideas that we had to make uh, the difficulty of the distractors vary. Uh, it, would, it, it, it was similar to that. So instead of taking the three first or the three best, we could like either set a threshold, as you said, or uh, select, I don't know, the uh, the number five, uh, four, five, six, for example, instead of uh, one, two, three, or let some uh, some 
don't take or don't always take the best distractors, but yeah, take uh, some some things that is in the middle, not good, not bad, or things like this. Of course, yeah. So basically, uh, if you want to augment a question answering data set, the only resource, and th that's a big only, uh, is uh, some sort of external knowledge like Wikipedia that factually presents uh, elements of the topics that you're interested in. Yeah. Okay, and a pre-trained model, of course, to, to fine tune. Um, do you know, do you think, because a lot of people in attendance right now are interested in uh, uh, in French uh, models, and since you're also a French-speaking person like myself, do, do, could you explain how we could use that kind of um, strategy for a French data set? I mean, is it possible? French, for French, the problem is I don't know if uh, someone already trained some general purpose question answering models such as Unified QA because in French, most of the time the problem, the, the problem with French is that uh, the resources are limited, like there is not much, uh, not a lot of data sets uh, for the question answering data sets in French. And so the main uh, problem that would arise is that you first need to have uh, some kind of pre-trained general purpose uh, question answering models, and this might uh, be an issue with, with French. Yeah, of course. I see. Are there any questions? Any other questions? In that case, uh, I would like to thank uh, Guillaume for his uh, excellent presentation, a very interesting topic. And um, we will now uh, move on to uh, the third presentation, a talk by uh, Florian Carichon, a PhD candidate at HEC uh, Montréal, who's going to present a talk uh, titled Abstractive Unsupervised Summarization of uh, Temporal Events. Hi, Florian, it's a pleasure to meet you. Hi, pleasure to be, to be here. Great. Would you like to try and share your screen? Yeah. Okay, that should do it. It's perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much, Florian. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, introduce quickly myself. So uh, I'm Florent Lachon. I'm a PhD, uh, PhD student at HEC Montreal, currently in third year. Um, and uh, I'm going to present you an abstractive and supervised summarization, uh, summarization model of uh, temporal events, which we called host. Um, this project was funded under uh, a MITEX agreement with the uh, Fédération des Caisses des Jardins du Québec, uh, IVADO and HEC, and I had the occasion to work on this project with uh, several uh, data scientists at Desjardins that helped me a lot on, the, on that project. So uh, today for uh, our uh, presentation, uh, I'm going to make a quick introduction of automatic text summarization in order to for uh, everyone to have a, a common ground of uh, what task we intend to do. Uh, then I will introduce uh, our uh, model uh, and at the end of the presentation uh, we will discuss about the different results that we obtained and uh, uh, make a quick discussion of, uh, of what our uh, next steps could be with that project. Um, so to make a, a, an introduction of uh, automatic summarization, uh, I like to uh, remind what is automatic text summarization uh, in the first place. Uh, so this is the process of uh, taking information, distilling information contained in the uh, different documents, which it can be one uh, single document or multiple documents, uh, and you try to produce by the means of a computer, obviously, a reduced uh, version of uh, of that text 
uh, usually uh, no longer than half of the text. And uh, what is really important in the definition too is that uh, this material should be oriented for a particular user and for a specific task that are going to define uh, the uh, information needs uh, uh, that we need to manage during the process of automatic text summarization. So uh, once we know this uh, definition, there are uh, uh, three uh, classic steps uh, in the process of automatic text summarization that are uh, always found in every system. Uh, the first one is uh, that you need to find a way to represent information uh, in order to highlight uh, the uh, uh, con the content uh, in the input document that might be considered important for your uh, user's need or for the task that you try to handle. Uh, then you have a part of uh, scoring the text document. So you have to design a function uh, that is going to put a score on the on the on the different text representation that you cr you created. Uh, and that's going to allow you to uh, to uh, score positively or more importantly the the, uh, the important segments that you want to include in the end of the of your summary. And the uh, last step of uh, automatic text summarization is obviously my maximizing that score because now that you have scored the the important segments of your text, you want to maximize the final score of your summary uh, in order to um, uh, include the 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 most numbers of elements in this constraint length space, uh, which is the, the, the summary. Um, there is different kind of task uh, in summarization, and I didn't want to, uh, to be too specific about it, so I'm just going to be quick on that. Um, for summarization, you can find the first uh, uh, task that you can find is either cr trying to create abstract extractive or abstractive summarizations which means that either you can try to uh, select a uh, segment of information directly from the input document and gather them uh, into your uh, 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 final summary, which is called extraction, or you can try to generate a new piece of uh, text that, uh, that try to uh, summarize the, the input documents, which is called abstractive summarization. And once you, you've decided to, uh, which, uh, which kind of uh, summary that you want to produce, um, you have different kind of tasks that you can address. You have all the, the kind of tasks uh, that are guided toward, toward a certain goal. So you find in there the query on oriented summarization where uh, the system is oriented toward uh, specific uh, uh, queries, which are often combined in uh, Q&A systems. You also have sentiment-based summarizations, for example, which are oriented towards specific sentiments that you want to try to uh, 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 summarize. Then you have a different uh, kind of, uh, of, of task, like the opinion summarization, where you try to uh, give another view of uh, general uh, uh, opinions of, uh, for example, customers about a specific product or a specific aspects of a product. Uh, you can have Personal, personalized summarization, for example, uh, where the content of the summary will depend on the profile of the user, uh, the targeted user of the of this summary. And in the end, uh, the task that is going to interest us today, which is uh, called update summarization, uh, where you have a context where uh, the user has already seen some previous information uh, and you must produce a new, uh, a new text based on that. Uh, so the formal definition is this one, is that uh, given a, an initial, uh, initial state of knowledge about an event um, and you have a new set of documents containing new information about this event, uh, the objective of uh, update summarization is to generate a summary containing this new content uh, that you add to the state of knowledge of your user. Um, when we speak about update summarization, we have different kind of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, parameters that we must take into account. Uh, first, we have to know if our summary uh, is going to be dynamic or progressive, which means that um, uh, in some case, we can have a summary that we add new pieces of information. So uh, we update dynamically the, the, the summary, or we can 
uh, produce new pieces of information and each iteration, uh, meaning that we progress through time with the summarization. So you can have either dynamic uh, summaries or progressive summaries uh, in update summarization. And uh, of course, uh, you have the kind of update that you have to manage because you can have only one update about an, ev an event, for example. So you have a previous state of knowledge and you generate a, a new piece of information, or you can you can have a continuous temporal uh, uh, update uh, through time that you need to uh, generate every at every iteration of time. You need to generate a new summary. So. Um, this kind of update summarization task uh, can have a wide variety of uh, application in uh, industrial world. Uh, we, uh, we see uh, the use of this kind of system for the push of notification for mobile application on specific events, for example. So when you see, for example, the CBC news and you have a new push of no notification about a, a specific event that you want to, to follow, uh, you can also uh, update the uh, update the information about uh, some customer uh, interaction in call centers or uh, based on the uh, social networks interaction like Twitter, uh, Twitter feeds, for example. Um, you can update information about maintain, uh, maintenance. So, uh, for example, you are, you can have different updates of uh, commits uh, for code maintenance. You have preventive maintenance reports for uh, for uh, machine machinery maintenance that you need to update information about that machine every time. Uh, you can have also uh, uh, what we call constructing point of view summarization, where you have a previous state of knowledge about some kind of sentiment, for example, positive sentiment, and you want to update your summary based on new sentiments about a product or, or an aspect. So these are the kind of uh, uh, application that you can find uh, in the industrial world for update summarization. Um, so now we, uh, I'm going to present the, the, the methodological approach that we uh, use to tackle uh, our uh, problem. So first I'm going to introduce what is the data set that we use to, uh, for, uh, for our uh, task. So the data set is called the Temporal Update Summarization Task, uh, um, which is produced by the, uh, the TREC uh, conferences. So this uh, um, data set is composed of news events uh, that are relayed by one media. And for each event, uh, we have an update text. So we have a source document. Uh, and for this, uh, this event, we have different updates that are gathered through the updates ID that we can see here. Every time we have an update text uh, uh, related to that update, for example, here we follow an event about a tra uh, train crash uh, that happened in Buenos Aires. Um, and every time we have a, a new update of information, so the, second, the, the first update is related to a previous event uh, that happened in the, 60, uh, the 70s. Right? Uh, the second update uh, informs us about the number of dead people uh, in, the, in that accident and so on. And for every of those updates, we have a, a gold standard reference uh, uh, that we can use to uh, uh, to uh, uh, measure the, that we will use to measure the performance of our model later on. So the objective is to keep track of uh, this information of our time and to provide a summary every time of that event uh, for every update. Um, before going uh, to present uh, the, the, the specifically the model, I would like to uh, just uh, present some industrial challenges that we had to, uh, to manage because as, uh, as we can see, I, I, I uh, uh, introduced the fact that we have, for example, labeled data in, uh, in this data set. We have to remind that we uh, work in a partnership with uh, 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 the Fédération des Caisses des Jardins du Québec. And uh, for the case of application uh, that we work at Desjardins, we have to consider that uh, the company has very little or uh, no label uh, data uh, for uh, their uh, application use. And uh, uh, there is a crucial need for unsupervised uh, uh, techniques. Uh, and one of the main advantage of uh, using those unsupervised methods also guarantee the reusability of our model. It can be retrained uh, with different kinds of data throughout the, the, the company's needs. 
uh, in case of uh, multiple uh, uh, use case uh, use cases in the company. One other uh, challenge that we had to manage is that our audience is not very familiar with the uh, the uh, dealing with uh, AI modern. The, uh, um, so we had to produce some something that is similar to uh, to uh, the output output that human can produce because um, to facilitate the integration of the model in the everyday life of uh, the uh, Desjardins employees. So the attractive uh, approach was uh, our natural cho choice to do that. And uh, finally, uh, we have to find we had to find a way to uh, manage novelty throughout uh, the different updates. Uh, because uh, depending on the uh, intended application, we didn't know if our model should be able to favor uh, the reuse of information, so to promote uh, cohesion of information and promote redundancy throughout the different updates, or if, if it should push uh, uh, new information at every update. So the model we came uh, with is uh, the model that we call host for the abstractive and supervised summarization of temporal event. Uh, uh, this model uh, is a, a simple, uh, simple auto encoder uh, that we uh, um, that we can see on the part uh, on the left and the summarization that uh, uh, we produce. This is a, a regular auto encoder. Uh, the modification that we made uh, to this auto encoder is that we add an iterative process to it, um, uh, meaning that at each iteration, uh, our model uh, received the, the text of the update, the current text of the update, but also uh, uh, concatenate uh, this uh, information and this representation with the uh, previous summaries that the model uh, already produced. Uh, we use the previous summary because at each iteration, we consider that uh, this summary represents all the state of knowledge that are included in the temporal uh, uh, stream of information. Because if we produce the, the model at the iteration, let's say number three, the summary already includes the information of the two previous uh, texts. And so using that uh, for uh, create, generating our text at the third iteration uh, allows us to embed the whole state of knowledge of the user at each iteration steps. And so we use that information uh, to generate our new summary. And so the adaptations uh, that we have made to the Anto encoder model after, after that is that we had a controlling uh, length output, which is uh, a common technique in the in state of the art right now for uh, summarization uh, uh, auto encoders, and uh, so we uh, modified our uh, error function uh, to add uh, the uh, the the reconstruction of our previous summarization uh, summaries in the in, in the model, and we add uh, uh, lambda parameters uh, in the reconstruction of our uh, input text. Uh, and that parameter can vary through um, uh, the values between minus one and one. Uh, and it, uh, uh, we vary these parameters because we made the hypothesis that uh, for negative values of lambda, our model is going to be encouraged to uh, uh, select information from the, uh, the current text and penalizing the information he has already pushed to the user, thus promoting the novelty of information in the new summary. And if we have a positive uh, lambda, um, the model is instead going to promote the redundancy of information, thus promoting the cohesion of the uh, summary through time, reusing some uh, information that he has already showed to the user. So this is where uh, this lambda is very uh, interesting and important for us. Um, so now that uh, I had uh, uh, pre I, I presented my uh, my model, I'm going to present the different results that we uh, we get and the next step that uh, we uh, we hope to uh, to do uh, in the future. Uh, so first, before going uh, uh, to present uh, our results, I want to introduce quickly uh, 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 for once again everyone having the same uh, ground uh, in uh, summarization some uh, the, the classical. Uh, uh, ways to uh, measure the performance in uh, for automatic text summarization. So the first one is rouge, which is 
uh, which stands for Recall Oriented Understudy for Gisting Evaluation, which is an equivalent of the blue, uh, the blue scores uh, that we know for automatic text summarization. This is the uh, uh, most used and the most classic assemble of methods for evaluating text summarization. Uh, and it works by comparing the number of common uh, n-grams between the generated summary and a gold standard that have been uh, generated by one or multiple human experts uh, to summarize the, 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 the input text. Then when we have the, uh, the, the, the text produced by those humans, we measure the precision and, and recall for uh, uh, the rouge score. So, for example, if I give an example of the uh, of the uh, rouge recall score, for example, you can see that uh, you, you, your model can produce a, a sentence like the hello, a cat, dog, fox jumps. Obviously, it's not a coherent sentence, but that's not the purpose of uh, our uh, summarization system right now. And the reference text is the fox uh, jumps, and you measure, for example, for the recount, uh, the count of n-gram that match the uh, the uh, reference text, which is all the all the words uh, included in the reference are included in the model, so it makes a recall of 100 percent. So um, this is a very popular and uh, metric, but in the recent years, uh, a lot of papers have shown that Rouge presents many known uh, shortcomings. So we had to uh, include another way to evaluate our system, especially for uh, unsupervised systems that do not rely on uh, learning the, the the way to produce the summary based on the on the on the uh, on label data. So we used a, a new uh, metrics uh, metric sorry, um, uh, that is called SUPERT, uh, that have been uh, uh, published in 2020 and stand for summarization evaluation with pseudo, ref uh, pseudo references and BERT. Uh, so the, the model basically is an unsupervised uh, uh, system that works through uh, BERT encoding. So you take the multiple documents of the, uh, of the, uh, the multiple input documents and you create a representation of uh, of each document through uh, BERT, the BERT system. So you create a representation of of, uh, of those inputs, which is going to technically uh, um, uh, the representation is going to technically extract the uh, the silent uh, sentences from the uh, from the input documents. And so you have the representation that has been generated by your model. So you have the embedding of your summary. And uh, what you simply do is measure the similarity between those two representations uh, in the paper using the word mover, uh, mover's distance, uh, for example. And this is going to compute a, a, a summary relevance score that is going to measure at, at what point, uh, 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 what, how much of the content of the original uh, document is represented in your uh, uh, summary. Uh, so for the score that uh, the performance that we get with our uh, uh, model, um, first, um, before going further, I would like to precise something that is going to be important for the rest of the evaluation that I'm going to present. Um, the, we have made some evaluation of the gold standards that are uh, provided with the data set, so the nuggets that are generated by humans. And we have computed the super uh, score and the rouge, uh, rouge one and rouge two precision score for this data set. And we have a, some scores about 9% similarity for super and 23% uh, 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 precision for rouge one and 5% precision for uh, 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 rouge two. And why this is important is that uh, this lack of uh, similarity between the nuggets produced and the uh, the, 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 the input documents explain the, uh, some performance about uh, supervised systems that are going to really struggle to reproduce the output of uh, 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 the gener to generate the output uh, uh, expected because they learn on data that uh, has simply too much noise uh, to be able to, uh, to be reconstructed. And I will show you a clear example of what I mean uh, just after. So for our baselines uh, to compare our model, uh, the first one we've uh, we've done is a, a classic one in automatic text summarization, which is 
the uh, the first n words. So here, the first nine words. Uh, we took nine because the average uh, uh, sentence uh, length output of our system is approximately nine words for uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 track data set. So we took the first nine words of each document and we measured the score of uh, these first nine words toward rouge and super. We also use an unsupervised sec sequence to sequence model, which is basically our model without uh, the uh, uh, with considering a lambda equal to zero, uh, meaning that you have a classic uns uh, uh, sequence to sequence unsupervised autoencoder sequence to uh, sequence model. Anyway, uh, uh, to measure the impact of uh, considering the dependency through time. Uh, by adding, adding the lambda and comparing the result with our model. We have the two best settings of our model, either for uh, 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 positive or negative lambda, which is located around uh, 0.2 for the value of lambda. Uh, we have compared uh, our model with an unsupervised model produced by uh, Fevri and Al in 2018 and with a supervised model, which is the pointer generator network, uh, uh, the produced in uh, 2017 by CNR. So, as we can see, uh, the baseline, uh, the first nine words baseline performed the best for almost every metric except for support, uh, which is kind of normal because it's one of the uh, known rouge uh, limitation for news information because news information has a, a very typical uh, structure, a way of structuring information, which is called the pyramid structure, where the most important content is often located in the first uh, few sentences of the text. So it's not surprising, it happens a lot when you uh, apply rouge with uh, those kind of baseline that uh, they perform the best. Um, what is interesting is that our model is often the second best performing model among uh, the different uh, metric, either the adding or substitution part of the of the model, and we obtain also the uh, the best results uh, for BERT, uh, even if we don't beat the, the our uh, first baseline for support um, uh, for uh, uh, compared to the to the uh, classic uh, autoencoder. So. Uh, uh, for super, the results, the contribution of lambdas are to be uh, 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 like is marginal, but uh, we improve uh, the precision of rouge. Uh, 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 we really improve the precision of rouge compared to that model. So uh, we have very interesting uh, results for uh, the application of lambda. Uh, and we can see uh, one of uh, 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 the sample of the generated summary that we uh, we have with our model. Uh, so uh, I've taken an example of uh, a source text that we have in our uh, track data set. And for each of those source texts, we uh, generated uh, some summaries with our host model with a, lam a positive lambda of 0 0.2, so the add 0 to model that we shown before, the one that gave us the best support uh, support score. And uh, uh, we can see that uh, uh, some inst interesting phenomenon happening, like uh, the reuse of some words that are not included in the uh, in the source text, because we can see that here uh, the text speak about 340 people injured passenger, and our model uh, favor the reuse of casualties present in the previous summary. And uh, we can see also uh, uh, the same phenomenon happening in the third iteration where uh, we, uh, uh, we uh, uh, reuse the secre uh, secretary Jean Juan Pablo Schiavi uh, instead of just using the transportation secretary. So uh, here it's very useful when you produce progressive summarization, when you, you re replace uh, the previous text with the news, new one in, put, uh, in push not uh, notifications, for example, because if uh, 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 someone has missed, for example, one of the push uh, uh, notification. Uh, it's uh, uh, desir uh, desirable to um, uh, to uh, uh, reuse, for example, those name entity to uh, to make more coherent uh, summary in the notification push. And uh, one of the phenomenon that uh, I uh, sp spoke about just before. 
uh, explaining the, the poor, uh, poor performance of the uh, supervised approach uh, that we uh, try to, uh, to, uh, to uh, that we try to implement on the on this data set is that uh, for uh, a lot of uh, gold standard nuggets, uh, the human uh, the humans that produce the text including information that you can't find in any of the uh, 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 any of the source text like, uh, like this piece of information saying that there is uh, uh, 676 plus injuries in the train accident uh, in the train accident and if we compare to the source text there is no way uh, for the mod for a model to to uh, come with uh, this number and uh, uh, for a model which uh, based is learning on those gold standard uh, models uh, nuggets uh, uh, like the pointer generator, it's uh, really adding too much noise for the model to try to generate those new pieces of information, and uh, and the, the the learning signal is uh, is very weak, and the model uh, the supervised model uh, perform really poorly on on the, on on this data set in a general manner. Um, so for our next steps, oh, I did not know I have a animation. Uh, sorry, here I'm going to yeah. Here, um, uh, we want to study the influence of the lambda parameter on the selection of information, uh, uh, especially uh, because right now uh, we have seen the phenomenon that uh, the best performing lambda is for a value around 0 to either negatively or uh, positively. Uh, this is uh, due to the fact that extreme value uh, extreme value like minus one or uh, uh, plus one penalize, penalize too much uh, uh, grammatical words uh, in the summary pro uh, production, like words like the, of, to, uh, are going to be penalized too much or uh, or uh, promote too much by the model, and you end up with a summary that makes uh, no sense uh, 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 with extreme value of lambda. Uh, but we want to tr uh, try to uh, to understand uh, more the impact of this parameter uh, with different kind of data set that have, do not have that uh, uh, specific parameter structure of information like news information. We also want to uh, try to implement the lambda parameters on different state-of-the-art model like uh, the one we introduced by Fevry uh, to really uh, show the, 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 the what can really bring the lambda parameters to different kind of models. And uh, the other next step is that we want to focus on the uh, the novelty properties of of that lambda uh, parameters because uh, uh, we know that the novelty can be applied on different level of the summarization process. You can either apply novelty on the scoring part of elements, meaning that you penalize the score of the elements depending on the novelty you want to promote. You can also penalize penalize the, the, the novelty or in, uh, promote the novelty of information when you select the pieces of text or when you generate text, meaning in the three uh, classic steps of automatic summarization. And uh, uh, recently, uh, there is a lot of new methods uh, that have been proposed to, uh, to manage novelty in deep learning systems. Uh, and we've seen some uh, system adding novelty in the scoring part uh, uh, of uh, of the deep learning system, especially with the diversification of attention learning the, the, uh, in, in those models. We also have seen uh, uh, a lot of papers uh, trying to uh, diversify the output in the generation of text, uh, creating some modification of the beam search uh, the beam search algorithm to promote diversification but we did not see uh, for now uh, uh, algorithm that promote div uh, diversification of the novelty in the selection process of information and this is where our model uh, model is uh, uh, coming and we want to uh, to uh, study the impact of the combination of different uh, uh, novelty process in deep learning method to 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 measure what impact uh, uh, is made by different kind of system and uh, uh, in the, in those method. Um, and uh, that's it for uh, my presentation. Uh, thank you for uh, your attention. And uh, now I'm going to take some questions if uh, if there is some. Thank you so much, Florian. Uh, très intéressant. Um, 
So now we have a, a few minutes uh, for a question for uh, Florian um, on his uh, presentation and abstractive summarization. Once again, I invite you to uh, use the raise hand uh, uh, button to uh, ask questions. I know I have a few, but uh, I'll let people uh, ask their questions first. If you have a question, I'll uh, leave the floor to you uh, if uh, you raise your hand. So um, I guess I'll, I'll go first, uh, Florian. Um, yeah. Um, on slide 11, you show the uh, architecture of your uh, neural network and um, just a few clarifications. Uh, it's always uh, quite complex to look at those in, in a few minutes. So, uh, yeah. so if I understand correctly, you have uh, two representations, the new text and the text that has been produced up to now, and then you yeah. concatenate them that's the little plus that you show. And then after exactly. that, I'm not entirely sure what happens. Do you use a, a language model? Is it like a seek to seek architecture where you produce the text? What's going on? Yeah, it's a sequence to sequence architecture, uh, which use a, a, a GRU uh, decoder, uh, a simple uh, a GRU de decoder to produce the text uh the output summary uh that summary uh the only uh, constraint that we put on the generation on that uh, uh, of this summary is the length output meaning that we force our mod uh, 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 sequence to sequence model to generate a piece of text that is shorter than the input uh, that the input text um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, the only modification that we make to the sequence to sequence uh, architecture of, uh, of that model. Since uh, the length is so important uh, in summarization, could you uh, explain a little more how you, uh, you force the decoder to produce uh, text uh, below a certain length? Yeah. Uh, uh, of course, uh, we add, uh, 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 we follow the, the paper of uh, uh, Fan and Grangier uh, 2017, meaning that uh, we introduce some uh, categories of lengths uh, in the uh, decoding process. We create some kind of embedding uh, representing the lengths of the, of the model, uh, which are uh, uh, different categories of lengths. Uh, meaning that uh, uh, for your input summary, let's say that you want to uh, summary at 15% uh, uh, of the summarization. So you can create uh, categories of lens for each input summary uh, text that you have. Um, uh, you can pre produce like 10 categories, for example, of potential length. And you provide this, uh, this category as an embedding uh, to the decod decoding step. And after that, when you provide him this information, uh, you uh, you uh, force the model to stop its generation process at the desired output length. So the model has the information in an embedding to uh, to learn that uh, uh, given the category that we provide to the model, he has going to have some kind of limitation to the number of words he's going to produce at the, in the end of the process. So the model is learning to uh, to say, okay, you give me uh, that category, I, uh, I kind of have to predict that I can't put all the words in my uh, uh, generation process at the end. So it's going to learn to uh, select the most important information due to that constraint. Okay. The information you provide in the, in the beginning. I see. So uh, if the model produces too long uh, um, uh, a sequence, then it's penalized uh, importantly, and yeah. uh, it learns to 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 be uh, brief. Exactly. Very interesting. Uh, the when you presented the results. Uh, yeah. Uh, near the end of your presentation, uh, just after that, the examples that you provided. Um, oh yeah. The next, I think it's yeah exactly. Um, 
It seems to me that, uh, so there are two elements in the evaluation, at, at the very least, the human evaluation of summaries. It's the, the content and the fluency, so the quality yep. of the text. It seems to me that the, the content is really good, but the fluency is not that great uh, yep. for the generated model. So uh, the first one is a good example. Emergency, fatal casualty, suburban train, failed break. It's a very... Uh, very strange uh, generation. Do you have any comment about that? Uh, yeah, uh, of course. Uh, first, uh, uh, our uh, work is uh, in progress, that, uh, meaning that the study of uh, the fluency is going to be uh, made on Amazon Mechanical Turk, so we don't have currently the results uh, for the, 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 uh, the, the fluency measure, because uh, in most, most of the time it's performed by human evaluators, uh, evaluators that you ask to uh, measure the fluency of uh, your generated output. And uh, then uh, the, the uh, first uh, goal of that project was to uh, propose a model that can uh, improve the uh, content of the generated summarization uh, summaries by uh, uh, handling the novelty or the cohesion of information inside the generated piece of pieces of text. Now uh, we know that for uh, uh, next steps we have to uh, improve the the the, uh, the fluency of the model. One way to uh, to do that is to use uh, more recent and advanced model because right now our architecture simply re uh, uh, re uh, rely on uh, GRU and Gloves embeddings. Uh, we know by using transformers and the new architectures proposed in the literature, the pre-trained model, we can uh, uh, largely improve the fluency of model because it has been shown in the in the uh, 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 automatic summarization literature. Um, so we have uh, uh, ways to improve that fluency, but yeah, we know that uh, it's a really uh, uh, a problem that we have to manage, especially for uh, the industrial application of our model. Because one uh, thing that I've mentioned uh, before is that. Uh, we have to deliver that system to uh, Desjardins employees uh, and those texts need to be understable uh, really easily by those employee uh, employees. So uh, we know that we have to make some improve on that part. Uh, the, the main focus of our uh, papers is, uh, is, uh, is the uh, improvement of the information, so the content proposed in the, the summary. Uh, uh, but for the industrial uh, application, we are going to to make uh, some efforts to uh, to improve uh, the fluency of the model. Yes, it's an important aspect. You're right. Um, are there any other question? Maybe a last one. In that case, I'm going to. Uh, Thank uh, Florian, a very interesting presentation on an interesting topic, uh, very well done. Thank you. Uh, and um, I'm going to, uh, to thank again our three presenters, Yutao Chu, Guillaume Lebert, and uh, Florian Carichon. Um, thank you also everyone for attending this uh, meetup. I hope you enjoyed uh, the presentations. Uh, next time, uh, maybe uh, a little more questions from, <laughs> from the audience. And uh, I would like to invite you to stay tuned for more news about the uh, upcoming meetup, which will take place in November. And once again, uh, a recording of this event and the presentations of Yutao, Guillaume and Florian will be uh, uh, available shortly on our website at uh, en.clickai.quebec. Uh, I would also like to invite you to provide the feedback via the survey that you're going to receive by mail. By mail. Uh, it's also, so always great to uh, receive suggestions about uh, talks and presentations or even problems that you would like to see discussed in a talk uh, during this meetup. Uh, always uh, interesting to get uh, your suggestions. So I think that uh, we're going to conclude now. Uh, I look forward to seeing you uh, all next time in November. And until then, have a pleasant day. Good day. <laughs>